It's my pleasure to introduce Thomas S. Ulin. Professor Ulin is Swanland Chair Emeritus, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and Professor Emeritus of Law at University of Illinois, where he taught from 1983 to 2010. He was Distinguished Visiting Professor at Texas a and University School of Law and a Hagler Institute Fellow at Texas A&M also. He studied at Dartmouth College, the University of Oxford, and Stanford University, where he received a PhD in economics. He retired from University of Illinois in 2010, and he holds an honorary degree from KU Luden in Belgium. His textbook, On Economics, is now in its sixth edition, and it's been translated into Arabic, Chinese, French, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Russian, Slovenian, Spanish, and other languages. He's also a co-author with Bob Lawless and Jen Rubinolt of Empirical Methods and Law, published in 2016. Um, this book has also been translated into many languages. He edited and wrote several essays in the Methodologies of Law and Economics, published in 2017. He's working on the seventh edition of Law and Economics, uh, and also on a monograph on the vital role of empirical evidence in law and public policy. Thank you.
convey what's in the professor's notes and what's in the student's notes without filtering it through the minds of either, uh, is, is coming. It's not that far away. I had a Chinese student several years ago who taped all of my lectures for a full semester, and I wouldn't be surprised if those were a darn good substitute for having the real thing. Uh, it's clear, too, that people are very upset about uh, automation. Uh, the Pew Research Survey found that 85% of Americans are in favor of policies to restrict the rise of robot bots beyond hazardous work. Uh, and there's some evidence to suggest that uh, automation anxiety has influenced some very significant public policy decisions recently. Uh, there's a scholar at the University of Pennsylvania who is to be taken very seriously who suggests that high rates of factory automation swung three key, key Midwestern states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, for candidate Donald Trump in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, and we also know that two unsuccessful candidates for Democratic uh, presidential nomination this uh, election cycle, Bill de Blasio, and Andrew Yang both made automation anxiety a significant portion of their uh, campaign uh, uh, features. Um, I want to uh, sound three notes of caution uh, about automation anxiety. And let me, let me suggest this uh, before I begin this. The first two, I think, uh, I will try to shoot down. But the third one, I think, is something that we need to take very seriously. The first note of caution uh, has to do uh, with the, the belief that uh, disruptive technology erases jobs and, and is therefore to be stopped or slowed down uh, has been with us for a long, long time, longer than I suspect uh, you, you think. Let me give you some examples. The Emperor Vespasian who ruled between 69 and 79 of the uh, Common Era, uh, refused to allow the adopt adaptation of machinery to move columns to the Capitoline Hill in Rome because of employment concerns. The Gutenberg printing press was introduced with grave concerns on the part of professional scriveners, card makers, and stationers throughout Europe who recognized that it posed a tremendous threat to their livelihood. In 1589, Queen Elizabeth I refused to grant a patent to a man named William Lee for the landmark labor-replacing invention of the time, the stocking frame knitting machine. And she said to him, I quote, Thou aimest high, Master Lee. Consider thou what the invention could do to my poor subjects. I would, it would assure, assuredly bring them to ruin by depriving them of employment, thus making them beggars, unquote. That's not so bad, considering what happened in the uh, early 17th century to a man named Anton Moller of Danzig. Danzig invented a loom that allowed the weaving of two or more webs on one loom, threatening the livelihood of several weavers, many weavers. The city council of Danzig was approached by Moeller, uh, who wanted them to issue a patent in his favor. Instead, the council, quote, ordered him to be strangled for threatening the well-being of the leaders of the town. <laughs> From the outset of the Industrial Revolution in the mid-18th century until today, there have been repeated complaints about technology and its disruptive effects on labor. Uh, uh, let me give you, I, I can't remember where I am. Oh, uh, I want to give you three examples of uh, automation anxiety from the history of the United States that are both instructive and probably unknown to you. Uh, first of all, Professor Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics several years ago, uh, notice that it writes in, in his most recent book, Narrative Economics, that the popular explanation of the Great Depression from 1929 to 1933 was that there was underconsumption. People weren't spending enough on consumer goods. Why were they not spending enough? The view was that workers who had been replaced by machines were worried about their future and were hoarding their money. 
so that it was automation anxiety 1930s style that it was a reason for the Great Depression. I should say that that's not the accepted view in the economic profession, but it, it was a, a popular view. Uh, second, um, I don't know if you know this, but in the early 1930s, there was a great kerfuffle in the United States Senate about the introduction of dial telephones. Uh, the dial telephone had been invented in 1892, but until the 1950s, the majority of telephones in the United States were connected by what are called party lines. One of my grandmothers had one of those. We picked up the telephone, were connected to a central registry where the woman, there's always a woman, uh, was asked, who asked her to connect you with so-and-so, and they would. And you could also, if you were so inclined, listen to other conversations on the party line, uh, if, if that was what I voted your way. Uh, in 1930, the Senate authorized the installation of dial-up telephones in every senator's office. Senator Carter Glass, a very famous senator at the time, and one of the co-authors of the Glass-Steagall Act, introduced a, a resolution calling for the removal of the dial phones. And I think what he said about it is instructive. He said on the floor of the Senate, I ask unanimous consent to take from that Senate Resolution 74 directing the Sergeant at Arms to have these abominable dial telephones taken out of the Senate side. I object to being transformed into one of the employees of the telephone company without compensation. <laughs> I quote. The third example I want to give you is farm employment and the introduction of the tractor. Most farm machinery was drawn by draft animals uh, who were tended and supervised by farm laborers until around the turn the, the, the years just after the First World War. Between 1917 and 1960, gasoline-powered tractors were introduced into farming in the United States. The result was a loss of draft animals, a freeing up of 25% of the arable land in the United States for the use uh, of other things besides growing things for draft animals, and the loss of 1.7 million jobs of uh, farm laborers. Now, the central points so far uh, are that despite these grave concerns, dating back to Emperor Vespasian and continuing with the three examples in the United States. The technology triumphed. You can't stop it. Uh, the, dis the displaced workers found alternative employment, and the economy prospered. Um, the second note of caution I want to draw your attention to is it's wrong to perceive that introducing technological change always costs jobs. It sometimes, uh, counter our expectations, increases employment. That was the example with the automated teller machine, ATMs. I think a, a plausible prediction would be that the introduction of <coughs> ATMs from the mid-1980s on, or early 1980s on, would have displaced people who handed out money to you when you went into the bank and asked for a, a withdrawal. Between 1980 and 2000, <coughs> And the number of ATMs quadrupled to 400,000 throughout the United States. And of course, it's probably doubled since. Uh, but it didn't cost tellers jobs. The number of tellers rose by as much as 20% between 1980 and 2010. How can that be? Because even though the average number of tellers per branch <coughs> office fell from 20, in 1988 to 13 in 2004, the number of branch offices rose significantly by as much as 43%. And that increase in branch offices and drawing fewer tellers led to an increase in the total number of bank tellers, even though ATMs had sucked up a lot of <coughs> jobs. The first, uh, the, th uh, the third note of caution uh, that I want to sound uh, that I hinted at in my question to Posey was uh, every one of these uh, technological innovations that I referenced here, and many, many more, provided social benefits that were significant. We tend to focus only on those social benefits without recognizing that there are sometimes social costs. 
particularly the transition costs that workers displaced by the new technology have to suffer. They and their families have to relocate, retrain, uh, and become public charges in some uh, circumstances. Um, I want to try to suggest that there's a way in which we can have uh, our cake and eat it too. Uh, we can have innovation and yet not suffer the social costs if we design our public policy appropriately. Let me first uh, say something about the implications of the first two cautionary notes uh, that I sounded. Uh, the first two would seem to suggest that there's no reason to worry. Don't get hysterical about this. Calm down. It's happened before, and it will all work out. The only reply one can make that makes any sense is, well, but this time is different. I won't surprise you to hear that that has been said before. But I really think that this time might be different, and I'll try to explain why in just uh, a second. Uh, history is usually a very good guide for us in thinking about the future, that is, from now forward. But sometimes it misleads us, and this may be one of those times. But I hope that the, pro the policies I'm going to suggest uh, uh, are, are flexible enough so that they can be introduced uh, modestly and we can ramp them up if it turns out that things really are as bad as I suspect they are going to be. In the meantime, uh, I think that we ought to not do anything that stifles the innovation machine uh, in the United States. Well, uh, uh, what why is this why might one think that this uh, time is different? I think that the, the strongest argument is the current technological innovations and the ones that we're likely to uh, engage in in the near future are all artificial intelligence related. And this is different. In the past, uh, technology has usually caused the substitution of animal or natural power for human power or the substitute of artificial power for natural power, and so on and so forth. But nowadays, there aren't many places for us humans to retreat. 80% of jobs in the United States today are service related, uh, and we don't know of another sector in the, in the economy. It doesn't exist, uh, that other sector that can soak up the people who lose jobs when auto automation takes over the service industry, as it is likely to do. But what more? What more can I say to try to suggest that this is different? Well, you know about the remarkable achievements of AI in the last 40 years, 30 or 40 years. In 1997, IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, the reigning world chess champion, in two six-game matches. Should have got our attention, perhaps did get our attention, but perhaps not as much as was warranted. In 2016, the program AlphaGo, developed by Google, defeated Lee Sedol, the 18-time World Go champion in four games of a five-game match. Now, any of you who play Go ought to sit up and pay attention because that was a game that was thought could not possibly be automated. But these things pale in comparison to Google's Alpha Zero. Alpha Zero uh, was, in late 2018, introduced as a chess program it was more than a chess program, it was introduced to, to take on Stockfish 8, the reigning world ch computer chess champion since 2016. Stockfish 8 was thought to be unbeatable. It could calculate 70 million chess positions per second. Alpha Zero could only do 80,000, as compared to 70 million positions per second. Moreover, when Alpha Zero was introduced, it didn't know the game of chess, didn't know the rules, didn't know how to play a game. But what Alpha Zero had that Stockfish 8 did not have was machine learning techniques. It was given the rules of chess and allowed to play several games against itself to try to learn how to do things. How long do you think that Alpha Zero was allowed to do this? Any guesses? Days. Weeks, months, three days, four hours. After that practice, Alpha Zero played Stockfish 8 in 100 games. Alpha Zero won 28, tied 72, and lost 9. Now, 
in my view, when I read this, I thought, uh-oh, it's worse than we think. They're coming for our jobs. They? They're coming for our jobs. And we may well be on the way to what Daniel Susskind in his marvelous new book, A World Without Work, calls A World Without Work. I want to say just a, a brief word about this, because I love to read. And, and I want to give you these examples of, of how automation anxiety has worked its way into famous art. Uh, most recently, Ian McEwen, the great uh, English novelist, wrote this book about, it's the title Machines Like Me, about a, a robot that takes his girlfriend away from him, uh, the author's girlfriend away from, from him. Okay, what should we do about all this? Uh, I think that we ought to begin with something like a general theory. Technological disruption is a disruption, a, a, a disruption in society, and disruptions happen all the time. They happen from demographic changes, they happen from war, from foreign trade, from changing tastes, and from technology. Joseph Schumpeter, the great Austrian economist who emigrated to the United States, called this the gale, quote, the gale of creative destruction, unquote. And he said that that was just an inevitable part of, uh, of uh, life under capitalism. The question that this thought about disruptions in society raises is what ought we to do about them? Which disruptions should we address through government? Which disruptions should we simply let to work themselves out in society by having people alter their tastes, alter their employment, alter their training, and do other things to try to accommodate? After all, the United States between 1790 and the year 2020 went from a society in which almost 95% of the people were employed in agriculture and almost none in manufacturing and services to 2020 where 80% are employed in services, 2% are employed in um, agriculture, and approximately 7.5% um, are employed in manufacturing. And we did so with some disruptions, the Civil War notably, but not much else. Uh, we somehow accommodated ourselves. Well, what we ought to have in hand is a theory about what disruptions we ought to pay attention to and do something about, and which we ought to just either let play out and help in the, in, at the margins where we can, and try to identify whether what's going on today with AI disruptions in the employment markets is something that requires some specific and particular attention, or just let it work its way through, as the other disruptions from technology have done in the past 20, uh, 200 years or so. I think that we ought to find these guiding principles, uh, uh, apply these guiding principles to, to decide in deciding what to do. First, we want the social benefits that come with the disruption, uh, and we want those social benefits to greatly exceed the social costs. Otherwise, it's, it's a mistake. Uh, economists identify a difference between private costs and benefits and social costs and benefits. Gozi referred to this earlier. Uh, private uh, costs and benefits are things that individuals and firms and institutions bear and are perfectly capable of calculating. Not perfectly capable, but they're capable of calculating and acting upon. But there are costs that other people who aren't making these decisions bear. Uh, the decision, for example, to get inoculated against a communicable disease has external benefits. Sure, you're getting the shot to, to benefit yourself so that you won't get the disease, but it turns out that because you're inoculated, you're not going to communicate it to other people. And in the best of all worlds, they pay you for the benefit of not being inoculated. Never happens, of course. But uh, that's, that is the basis of our subsidization of inoculation of programs. So there is the possibility that we ought to entertain the decisions about adopting uh, innovations focuses exclusively on private benefits and costs and doesn't pay attention to the social costs and benefits uh, uh, as it should. And we want 
our policy is to take account of the fact that there may be social costs and benefits and include those in the calculus about whether this is an innovation we want to succeed uh, or not. There are ways uh, that, uh, that we talk about how to deal with these social costs and benefits. We, if the social benefits are truly greater than the social costs of a, of a particular innovation, then there ought to be some difference between the benefits and the cost that can be taxed away from the beneficiaries and transferred to the losers uh, through what's called the tax and transfer system. Um, um, so as to enjoy the net benefits without having costs involuntarily imposed on, on others. Uh, if, if we can, and I'll talk about some of these policies in just a moment, we ought to regulate invention, innovation only as a last resort. Uh, our theories of why and how people innovate are very, 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 uh, at a very, very early stage of development. Uh, we don't really know much about why uh, certain innovations appear when they do and are adopted as quickly or as slowly as they are and who these innovators uh, uh, are. Uh, but I, I, this is another point, I, uh, uh, the guiding principles I want to stress. Insofar as we can separate compensation for the losers from the disruption of the inducements to innovate, I'd love for us to do that. And it is possible through the tax and transfer system to do that. What options have been offered to try to deal with uh, uh, technological disruptions in the employment markets? Um, generally, it's been uh, suggested by several serious people that we affect technological choices in labor's favor. For example, Bill de Blasio, when he was running for president, made the suggestion uh, that we adopt uh, uh, a permitting process in which employers will only be allowed to introduce uh, labor-saving employment innovations if they can demonstrate how many jobs are going to be lost and what they're going to do to, to try to help uh, those whose uh, jobs have been lost through the innovation. I don't like that idea uh, because I think that uh, although it's not, it's a prudent thing to, to, to learn about, it'll cause employers in some cases not to adopt innovations that they ought to adopt. Then the responsibility for dealing with the people who've lost their jobs is not the laborers, it's societies. And I think we can develop a program that I'll mention in a bit uh, that is possible to do that. Others have suggested, uh, most recently Antonin Cor Anton Koronak and Joe Stiglitz, another uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner, that we put ethics first and economics second. I, I'm not exactly sure what they mean, and I don't necessarily disagree with them, but it, it's not clear exactly what that, uh, what they mean by that policy. Uh, two very, very good economists, Daron Asimoglu and uh, Paolo Ostropo, have argued that there have been the wrong kind of AI, that's their phrase, has been adapted, adopted, uh, and that innovators underestimate the social costs of innovation. That probably is true. They probably don't take those things into consideration in deciding what to put their uh, investigative resources into. And Asimoglu and Rostropo suggest that we can tax the wrong kind of AI and subsidize the right kind of AI. I, in theory, of course, but the operational problem is how to identify the right kind and the wrong kind of AI ex ante. I think that's such a, a, a burdensome task that this, this policy is probably not worthwhile. Better to let the things play out and then use tax and transfer to help. Bill Gates has weighed in on this issue too. And Bill Gates has proposed that we impose a tax on robots. You know, if you have uh, human employees, you have to pay FICA and other taxes on them. Why shouldn't you have to pay a tax on the use of a robot in the workplace? Uh, and those the proceeds of that tax can be used uh, to finance retraining, relocation, and other uh, programs. Larry Summers, the former Secretary of the Treasury and 
now uh, distinguished shareholder of Harvard, calls this protectionism against progress, unquote. A clever phrase, and I think he, he raises an important point. Taxing robots is going to raise the costs of adopting robots and may stifle innovation. Another possibility that's always raised is education. Well, let's just re-educate the workers who lose their job because of AI. Educate them to do what? I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not certain that there are any job sectors left. Uh, there may be. I think we have to let this play out for a couple of decades to find out. But it's not clear what education they have in mind. It may well be that the best use of the resources of those who have been displaced by technology is not to train them up for another job, but to train them up for community service. Caring for children, for example. Teaching people. I'll come back to an example like that in just a minute. The process, the uh, procedures that I want to uh, draw your attention to are transitional temporary aid for those displaced by technology. We already have a great example of this in our society. It's called trade adjustment assistance. Trade adjustment assistance was first introduced uh, in the Trade Act of uh, uh, 19, uh, I think, 64. Yeah, 62 in the Trade Act of 1974. It's had a rough life since then. There have been various administrations that have tried to kill it, others that have tried to cut it back, but it was reinstated in 2015. Uh, and it serves as a great model for exactly the sort of thing that I think would be useful for those who lose their jobs due to uh, technology. Uh, you could call this program because it probably already has a clever name and this isn't clever enough. Technological Job Loss Assistance. And it would operate along the same lines. Uh, it would allow, uh, as the trade uh, Adjustment Act does, it would allow consumers to enjoy the benefits of lower costs from the disruptive trade that has displaced the jobs workers, but provides public funds for retraining and relocation and temporary uh, unemployment insurance for those who can demonstrate that they've lost their jobs uh, due to imports. We could do exactly the same thing through this technological job loss assistance. It would provide transitional aid, for those who lose their jobs without stifling innovation. Another possibility that may be something we ought to start talking about today for the future is universal basic income. There's a great deal of interest these days, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley, which is the source of much of the technological change that's leading to this problem, in UBI, as it's called. It's been championed by the left, the right, millenarians, and others for a whole variety of different reasons. The very conservative author, Charles Murray, championed UBI as a way to replace all of the alphabet soup of uh, social programs that we give to various people. The people on the left have made arguments in favor of UBI because, Philip uh, von Paris from Belgium says, it would finally allow humans to be liberated and to achieve the things humans were meant uh, to achieve. There are problems. Two particular questions arise with regard uh, to UBI. The first is what David Susskind calls the admissions policy. Who gets UBI? Most commentators say everybody gets it for a whole variety of reasons. And here are two important ones. One is that it's administratively much cheaper just to send a check out to all 330 million, 210 million adults uh, in the United States of America. Uh, and secondly, there is no stigma associated with receiving this benefit, which I think is an important point. Uh, and the Susskind and others point out uh, that you could also tax away uh, the proceeds from those who don't need it, or they could voluntarily return it. Uh, Susskind champions something he calls uh, conditional basic income. He would not have everybody who's an adult over the age of 18, about 210 million people in the current United States. He would not champion that. He suggests that receiving uh, universal basic income is conditional upon you doing something for the public well-being. 
Uh, as you can see, there are lots of things to explore. I said there are two problems with UBI. The first is the admissions policy. The second and more daunting problem is how to pay for this program. It will be expensive. Let me give you some rough calculations. Uh, if UBI is available to every Delta in the United States, uh, that's 75% of the population, about 210 million people. And suppose they're each to receive $25,000 per year. Not enough to get wealthy, but enough to live on. The total annual cost of the Universal Basic Income Program would then be $5.25 trillion. The gross national product of the United States last year was $21.5 trillion. So the UBI alone would account for one quarter of the entire U.S. gross domestic product. The total federal budget for 2018 was $4 trillion. So UBI would be the double, not quite for various technical reasons, but almost double the, the federal budget in any given year. Uh, I don't think the country's ready for that, to say the least, uh, even though it may be a tremendously good idea. But it's something that I'm glad it's creeping into the public discussion because it may be something that we need or our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren need to be thinking. You'd be interested to know, I suppose, that, that UBI has been tried on a limited basis in various places. Finland just tried a two-year experiment that had, uh, I, I think it's, I, the reports say, were unsatisfactory results. Um, there are experiments going on in Ontario, in Livorno, Italy, and in several Dutch cities. The historian Yuval Noah Harari says that Israel has a version of UBI for ultra-Orthodox Jewish men. About 50% of those men do not work at all, instead devoting their lives to studying holy scriptures and performing religious rituals. And the national government gives those 50% of ultra-Orthodox Jewish men uh, and their families generous subsidies and free services. Uh, those are not elaborate generous uh, uh, subsidies, but they're, they're life-sustaining. These ultra-Orthodox Jewish men, quote, report higher levels of life satisfaction than any other section of Israeli society, unquote. Milton Friedman, the distinguished University of Chicago economist, champion, who was a champion of unregulated markets, uh, proposed in the 1970s that we have a guaranteed annual income, GAI. Uh, the government was taken by that proposal, also championed by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that the Fed, and so the federal government funded experiments regarding the GAI in four large American cities. Those experiments found a significant disincentive to work among GAI recipients, and therefore the program was killed. But notice that I'm talking about it, and I think those others who do are talking about it as a replacement for work, so that its disincentive effects on working for are, are a plus, not a minus. The meaning and purpose of life. I borrowed that phrase from, from Daniel Susskind, uh, uh, who says that in, in today's world, work <coughs> provides the meaning and purpose of most of our lives. Uh, we know from happiness studies, which are, if you haven't equated yourself with them, I, I urge you to do so. We know uh, from happiness studies that people who lose a job find a, a significant drop in their subjective well-being, and that drop in subjective well-being is not replaced when they get another job. That is, losing a job appears to be such a significant part of our subjective well-being today that losing one uh, takes a permanent toll on our subjective well-being. It's not quite as large as the toll that the loss of a spouse or partner or child takes, but it's close showing the centrality of work and defining the meaning and purpose uh, of our lives. Let me uh, conclude by telling you a, a story about my father and the meaning and purpose uh, of life. My father was an attorney in the largest law firm in the state of Indiana. And he, uh, his partnership agreement required him to retire by the end of the year in which he turned 70 years old, which was 1990. I knew from talking to him every week as I did that he dreaded uh, that uh, day. 
And this is from a man who did not like the practice of law. But he didn't know what he was going to do with himself when he was forced to retire. When he did, in fact, retire, uh, I would call him. And I, the first place I'd call was the office. And he'd be at the office. And I'd say, what are you doing at the office? And he'd say, oh, I'm just pottering around. I'm closing up a few files, handing off a few to my junior partners, and so on. And I'd say, why are you doing this? Why don't you go do something else? Well, I, I don't know what else to do with myself. By May of that year, in which he retired in December 31st, the previous year, by May, I quit calling him at the office. I called him at home, and he was in his house coat. And I'd say, well, what are you going to do today? And he said, well, I'm, I'm growing some peppers. I hit the phone to say, is this rock by you, won't you? He said, yes, I did. My father had never grown anything in his life. Uh, but he started growing peppers and introducing them in the pepper contest in the Indiana State Fair. <laughs> uh, and then in the fall of that first year that he retired, he saw uh, on the bulletin board at the Indianapolis Public Library an amount of a request for volunteers to help adult illiterates learn to read. He responded to that. He did it, and he told me later that that gave him more satisfaction than anything he had ever done in his life. And he didn't discover it until after he quit working. So I want to end on that hopeful note that I, I suspect that a century from now, when people look back on this time and see our anxiety about losing our jobs, they will think that we were sort of sad people for taking so much of our meaning and purpose out of the jobs that we did when we could have been enjoying ourselves in other ways for years and years and years. Anyway, thank you again, and I apologize again for uh, my having to leave shortly. Uh, if you have any questions or comments that I can answer in the next seven minutes. Yes, sir. I read maybe about seven, ten years ago about the year of singularity, and that's, that's when machines become smarter than people. Yeah. And it's like predicted for 2040 at that point. This is a Time Magazine article. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, is, will these problems just become, you know, at that point, or as we approach that point, where all these, will, di will the dislocations problems that cause become great? Do you foresee that? I, I can't foresee it. I'd be crazy to try to anticipate it. I, and the whole thrust of what I, I tried to focus on in talking about what to do about this is, is in essence, keep our powder dry. Uh, let's let this play out. Let's not interfere with innovation, because in most cases, not all, but in most cases, it's delivering significant social benefits to us. But when that day does come, uh, when, when Hal, uh, as the famous movement decides to turn on us and say you're no longer necessary. Uh, I, I have no idea if that will ever come. I doubt it, but it might. Who knows? I suppose by then we could all hop in spaceships and go somewhere else and start it all over again. <coughs> Let me say something that I, I mentioned before. I, human beings haven't exactly distinguished themselves by the wisdom and perspicacity of the they conducted themselves over the course of the last couple of centuries. Uh, there, there has been progress. I don't mean to be coy about this. There's been a lot of progress. But uh, maybe, maybe with the help of the right kind of AI, we can do better. We can be more generous. We have to be richer. Whatever it is that we need. And I, I, I don't think we can perceive the consequences of all of this. I do know this that I was trying to stress in the paper. This is all happening so fast that we don't have a lot of time to sit around and, and workshop all of this. I, if somebody had told me in 2005 that autonomous vehicles would be here within 15 years, I would have said, that's nuts. That can't possibly happen. It's too complex a problem. Well, apparently not. Uh, and now I've become such a convert, I wish they'd hurry up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I didn't say this in my talk, but uh, autonomous vehicles uh, will have problems, no doubt, and we'll find out about those when they're more widespread than they are. But the National Safety Council estimates 
that the 40,000 lives a year that we lose to automobile accidents, 94% of those are due to human error, and that AVs we might save 36,000 of those lives per year. That's a tremendous saving. I mean, I, it's trivial to point out that those 36,000 people can be incredibly <coughs> happy and creative and generous people and to have them lost to things like automobile accidents is, is dreadful. That's a good question. 
Um, I could it hear her? Could you repeat that question? She asked, can we as a society identify what's a benefit and what's a not of an innovation? Um, here's the alternative. And I'm not suggesting this opportunity works better, but it's the way it works now. And that is that somebody who's thinking of innovating has to persuade him or herself and those with, the, with whom he or she works and potential adopters that what they're doing is worthwhile. If I, if I were knowledgeable enough about this, I'd give you some examples of things, of innovations people tried that were non-starters that people just said, that's crazy. We're not doing it. Uh, but I, my point is that the, the process of, of devoting resources to innovation and trying to sell that innovation provides some sort of check. We have a similar one within the academy. People bring new things to the academy. And we're pretty good at that, filtering out those that are worthwhile and those that are and I think that work, that system works pretty well. And maybe it's a similar sort of system of getting yourself accepted in the marketplace with acceptance like those awesome and Restrepo. With that, I'd like to thank Professor Yulin. I know uh, you guys might still have burning questions. We're going to take a 10-minute break. And maybe Professor Yulin, if you want to stick around until we can answer questions. But again, thank you.